Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our fifth new math masterclass series entitled Internal Medicine as a Specialty, the Fast Track Way. Proudly presented to you by Newcastle University Medicine Malaysia in collaboration with Malaysia Advanced Acute Internal Medicine and Ultrasound Society, College of Physicians Malaysia and the Ministry of Health Malaysia. My name is Shira and I'll be your host for today. Internal medicine is a medical specialty that focuses on the care of adult patients and internal medicine physicians are experts who utilize scientific knowledge and clinical skills to diagnose, treat and compassionately care for people with illnesses ranging from minor to severe. With this event, we aim to provide a glimpse into how a young doctor can train efficiently for internal medicine via parallel pathway in the Ministry of Health Malaysia. Before we get started, I'd like to inform you will have the opportunity to submit text questions for today's guest speakers by typing your questions into the Q&A box. You may send in your questions at any time during the talk. We will address them during the Q&A session at the end of each presentation. Without further delay, I would like to welcome Professor Chris Baldwin, the CEO and Provost of Newcastle University Medicine Malaysia to give the opening speech. Thank you, Shira. Good morning, everybody. It is really nice to see you all here on this very beautiful morning here in Johor today. I would like to welcome you all to the next webinar in the New Med Masterclass series entitled Internal Medicine as a Speciality, the Fast Track Way. It is very great pleasure that I introduce you to our contributors today. And I'd also like to thank them all very much for joining us and giving up their time for this very um, important training session that we're having this morning. And I know everyone has very busy schedules, so it really is uh, a very great pleasure to have you here today. This is really truly a multi um, um, centre event, and the sessions that we have this morning will let, be led by Prof. Dato, Dr. Mrs. Q. Um, Siang Tong, um, Professor of Internal Medicine at IMU, Dr. Her Herman Ishmael, Director of Medical Development, Division of the Ministry of Health, Dr. G.R. Lechman Raman, Ath Raman Athan, President of the College of Physicians Malaysia and Professor of Medicine at Monash University, our very good friend Datuk Seri Paras Doshi, President of the Malaysia Advanced Acute Internal Medicine and Ultrasound Society, and um, consultant physician of advanced acute medicine and our very own Professor Ed Ong from Newcastle University Medicine Malaysia. Internal medicine is a rigorous and demanding discipline and to my understanding and colleagues may correct me if I have got this wrong, it gets its name from the German in air medicine. In the 1800s, German physicians began incorporating knowledge from a range of sciences, bacteriology, physiology, pathology, into their treatment. And these physicians found that the more they understood these subjects, the better equipped they were with um, to help their patients and to treat their patients. Thus, they were called internal medicine doctors because they focused on the inner disease rather than the external manifestations of disease. Thus, as Shira said, this speciality has the expertise to treat, um, to treat both common illnesses and very complex medical disorders, and may also specialize in treating long-term chronic diseases, such as type two diabetes, heart disease. To conclude, I would once again like to thank everyone who is contributing to the sessions today. Thank everyone who's come today, and I hope that you all have a very successful morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof Baldwin. Moving right along, it is now my pleasure to introduce our first guest speaker for today, Professor Datuk Dr. Mrs. Q Siang Tong. Professor Datuk Dr. Q is a professor in internal medicine at International Medical University, IMU Malaysia. Professor Datuk Dr. will be speaking on the overview of MRCP examination. Over to you, Prof. Can you hear me? 
Uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay. Can you see the slide? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bowen, for your kind introduction. And thank you to the organizer for inviting me to participate in this masterclass. And I'm uh, very happy to hear that it's already the fifth one <laughs> organized by uh, NewMac. Uh, my task today is to share with you the overview of the MRCP UK examination with the uh, audience here. So as you know, the MRCP Bracket UK examination is uh, jointly organized by the three uh, Royal Colleges of Physicians in, uh, in the UK. Uh, of course, you have the Royal College of Physicians London and uh, of uh, Edinburgh and uh, Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow. In, in the old days, uh, it was an individual uh, college organizing their own exam. But since the late uh, 1990s, uh, they joined together and, uh, and uh, organized the MRCP UK examination. And of course, that exam has uh, gone through many uh, changes. Okay, and the present, I'm going to share with you the present uh, format. There are three parts to the exam. I think many of you would know. Uh, all the parts can be taken in Malaysia. That has been for many years as well. So you have got part one, you've got part two A, you have got part two B, which is uh, called paces. And I, I will give a little bit of focus uh, on uh, paces uh, at, the, uh, uh, at, at my talk. So part one, we start with part one. Huh? Part one, you have to take it uh, 12 months after you graduate from MBBS or MBCHB or whatever it is. Uh, you have to be at least 12 months after the basic uh, medical qualification. And for all the three parts, you are allowed six attempts uh, and, and uh, not more after that. Uh, while I'm talking about MRCP UK, maybe just uh, one slide to uh, tell everybody that there's also the MRCP Island or MRCP I. Uh, it is also a recognized entry requirement for the uh, MOH uh, parallel pathway, which you are going to hear from uh, Dato Paras. Uh, it is slightly earlier than MRCP UK. You can, you can take the part one six months after graduating. Uh, also, there are three parts and maximum six attempts, six attempts for each part. And it is also recognized by the General Medical Council in the UK. You can take all the parts in Malaysia as well. And according to the website, it is easier to secure a place for the clinical exam in the MRCP island. Okay. Back to the MRCP UK exam. Huh? The part one has got two papers. Each paper has got a hundred MCQ, multiple choice questions huh, in the best of five format. Uh, the papers test knowledge of a wide range of common and important disorders in general medicine, uh, in typical encounter, both outpatient and inpatient setting. Uh, you will score one mark for a correct answer in the MCQ, and there's no negative marking, all right? Those are the, uh, the uh, topics that will be tested in the part one. You can see the, uh, you know, the various uh, subspecialty in um, internal medicine, cardiology, uh, gastroenterology, hematology, infectious disease, endocrinology, and so on. And the number of, uh, the number of questions in the two papers, uh, all these numbers add up to 200. So you have got uh, them divided into two papers. For the MRCP part two, you do the MRCP part two after passing the part one. Uh, there will be two three hour paper. Each paper has got up to 100 MCQs, uh, either in the form of best of five or in the form of N. N means the number of answers huh, from many, where usually there'll be two answers chosen from 10 available answers. And each question will be more clinical based compared to the part one. 
It has got a clinical scenario. It might contain some investigation for interpretation. It might also contain an image. Okay, so this is uh, part 2A. And after passing part 2A, then you go on to paces. And I will give you a little bit of background on the basic of the examination, the, the methods of assessment and the marking. And if I have time, I will share some tips uh, for the candidates. The well-known uh, carousel or the well-known uh, you know, five station concept of paces has been there for many years as well, but it's going to change soon. Uh, but uh, because of the pandemic, the change didn't take place. It was supposed to take place in 2020, the second diet, but uh, until now it hasn't taken place. So you look at the uh, five stations, station one, station two, station three, station four, station five, there are five stations. Uh, station one has got two system and two patients. Okay, you have got respiratory and abdomen. Station two is a history station, only one, there'll be one uh, surrogate, usually a surrogate. Uh -huh. uh, station three, there are also two uh, systems, the cardiovascular or neurology system, cardiovascular and neurology system, two patients. Station four is communication and ethics, one surrogate. And station five is the brief clinical consultation, two patients or two surrogates or one patient, one surrogate. So you have got this five station and eight encounters, either with patient or with surrogate. How many examiners? 10 examiners, because each station has got two examiners, okay? So there are seven skills that we test for the paces and uh, there'll be different numbers and combination of skills assessed at different stations. And for two examiners in every station, they are, they mark independently, okay? But having said that, they do a calibration at the uh, beginning or before the start of the exam. And they have to spend at least about half an hour to calibrate every station, okay? To come to some consensus before uh, initiating or before starting the, the actual uh, exam. There are three point marking scales, zero, one, two. Zero if is unsatisfactory, one is borderline, and two is satisfactory. Okay, so for one station, you've got two examiners, you get, if you have done it well, you get two plus two, four, four marks for that, for that particular station. And there's no overall judgment mark required from the examiners. So they just mark the skills, uh, you know, according to the station they are put in. So these are the seven skills that uh, we are talking about. Huh? Skill A, physical examination. Skill B, identify, identifying physical signs. Skill C, clinical communication. Skill D, differential diagnosis. Skill E, clinical judgment. Skill F, managing patients' concerns. Skill G, maintaining patients' welfare. So these are the seven skills that we are talking about. Okay. And this is the distribution of the uh, skills in the various stations. So as you can see, respiratory abdomen is station one, history taking is station two, cardiology and neurology station three, communication station four, brief clinical consultation or BCC station five. So you can also see very quickly that station five scored the highest number of marks, isn't it? Huh? Because um, every single skills to get a maximum of eight because there are two patients there, four plus four, and there are two examiners, okay? So you get the maximum of marks. What is the maximum marks that anybody can score uh, for the paces is 172, right at the, uh, the right lower bottom there, okay? What is the uh, passing marks? About 130, okay? So that is the pass marks and you cannot afford to fail a single skill. Once you fail a single skill, you don't pass the uh, paces, okay? I will go through skill uh, one by one. So physical examination is testing clinical examination technique. Just, you know, the examiner will watch how you do your, for example, your cardiovascular examination. Uh, it is not 
testing the ability to detect physical sign. That is skill B. This is skill A, physical examination. Okay. So this is identifying physical sign. And as I mentioned earlier, that the examiners will calibrate before the start of the exam. And they will agree to whether the signs uh, you know, are, are okay for the uh, for the uh, candidates to, uh, to, to look for and to identify. Are they a very difficult sign to look for? Uh, and so on. Uh. So they agree to what are the signs that should be there and should be found by the, uh, by the uh, candidates. So getting the right signs, you score marks. But if you are inventing signs, when there's no sign, you also will lose the marks. You get a zero. Huh? for unsatisfactory for inventing science. So both inventing science and not getting science uh, uh, will, will get you a zero marks, okay, for the uh, skill B. The next one is skill C, which is clinical communication, where you have to get a clinical history, uh, especially in station two and station five. And you have to also explain to the patient the information in accurate, in a clear, in a fluent, in a professional manner, you know, to get the patient to understand what uh, he or she is uh, having. So this is clinical communication. And then differential diagnosis is when you, after examination, you come up with a list of differential diagnosis uh, on a patient that you have uh, assessed yourself. And clinical judgment is skill E, where you negotiate a sensible and appropriate management plan for a patient or for a relative or, you know, or for a surrogate for that matter. Huh? And then you have to select appropriate investigations or treatment for the patient that you have already assessed. And you apply the clinical knowledge, sometimes including knowledge of law and ethics to the case. It may be necessary for you to use your knowledge of law and ethics, but usually not in great details, huh? okay? So this is exactly what I've just said. And skill F is to manage patient concern. So uh, the important part of this is to, you, you have to demonstrate the skill to listen to a patient or to a relative and confirm your understanding of the matter under discussion and demonstrate empathy. Huh? Very important is to demonstrate empathy. All right. You'll be watched all the time by the examiners. This is uh, maintaining patient welfare. Uh, the, the last skill to maintain patient welfare, to treat the patient or relative respectfully and sensitively and in a manner that will make sure that they are comfortable, they are safe, and they have their dignity. All right. So if, if you are judged to be rough, you get zero and you, know, you can't afford to get a zero from, you know, from your two examiner. The minute you get two zero, although you may score very well, you will fail the, the, the paces, you fail the exam. Okay, uh, including uh, candidates who cause patients significant emotional or physical discomfort or suggest a management plan that would jeopardize the patient's safety will be given an unsatisfactory at skill G. So this is, uh, this is very important uh, to uh, remember. But in my many years of as an examiner, I have not given a single candidate uh, a zero for skill G because most of them have behaved appropriately, okay? So this is the, uh, the same uh, table again. Now, looking at the various skills, what do you think is the hardest to, uh, to score? Or the uh, most uh, likely failure will come from which skill? Uh, I, I can't hear your answer, but uh, the highest uh, failure is uh, actually skill B, identification of physical signs. Okay. Uh, a lot of people fail because of skill B. Next, the second hardest is skill D, the differential diagnosis. And the third is skill C, the hardest, the third hardest huh, is skill C. So in terms of percentage, this, these are the figures that uh, we know before the pandemic. Huh? 
Uh, skill B, about 38% of uh, candidates actually fail in skill B, 38%, so close to 40%. Uh, about one third fail, fail in skill uh, D, uh, one third is uh, 33% or so, and then about a quarter fail in skill C, which is uh, communications. So this is, uh, you know, what we know about the, uh, you know, how hard or how difficult it is to pass the uh, paces, huh? the various skills. Okay. Uh, Shira, how much time do I still have? Uh, you still have 15 minutes, Prof. 15 minutes, huh? Yes, until 9.40. Oh, okay. I think okay. I still have five minutes and with 10 minutes of question answer time, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, okay. Okay, a little bit of tips on, uh, on paces for the candidates, uh, those uh, who are attempting the paces. It is actually very obvious to the examiner, you know, uh, how many times a candidate has carried out a physical exam by the way they conduct themselves, you know, to examine the patient in front of the examiners. So it is very important for, for you to demonstrate to the examiner you know, something which is uh, uh, well practiced in good order for every system. And the timing is also very important because uh, you don't want to, to spend too much time, neither do you want to spend too little time uh, when you are doing uh, you know, uh, the physical station. We are talking mainly the uh, station one, station three and station five. Huh? So practice and practice and practice, that is the key word. Huh? And also it's very important to give a good impression, both at the start and at the end of the examination. So at the start, I have watched uh, candidates, you know, they apply hand gel, uh, they ask permission uh, from the patient to uh, carry on with the examination. They ask about whether there's any pain and they make sure that the patient is in proper position, uh, in proper exposure. If necessary, make sure that there's a chaperone, which uh, the host center will ensure that uh, there's a chaperone around if necessary. And make sure that the patient is comfortable uh, before commencing the examination. So that's at the beginning. At the end of the examination, a lot of candidates uh, are so uh, caught up that you know, they forget to thank the patient or they forget to put the, you know, dress or the cover uh, for the patient, which uh, is, a, is a very bad show. Huh? So remember that. So remember to also behave like a doctor, not as an exam candidate. Huh? Okay. The other thing is uh, avoid starting your presentation uh, by referring to your patient as she, he, or patients, but rather you use the, uh, you know, the, the patient's uh, name, you know, like Mr. Mrs. Uh, to or Mr. Mrs. Uh, Pan and so on uh, uh, in the initial sentence. If you forget that at least you call, you know, this lady or this gentleman, you know, and, and he has got sign of this and that consistent with whatever that you think is the likely diagnosis. Huh? Okay, so address your patient appropriately. All right, that's also important. Those are all small points, but it's important for you to, to do it on a regular basis. And also to face the examiner and to keep the eye contact. And that's another uh, thing that we want to emphasize on. And remember, there are two examiners, not just one examiner. So keep eye contact with both the, uh, uh, both the examiners. Huh? Okay. And always uh, have a look Quickly at the uh, at the uh, patient's uh, med, uh, patient uh, side desk, you know whether there's any medication there because it may reveal the underlying diagnosis of your patient huh? unknowingly. Uh, okay, so have a look at the medication that is placed uh, next to the patient's uh, uh, bedside, and also always make sure that you gather your thoughts continually before presenting the case and. Uh, you know, if you feel that the further examination necessary, then uh, you make it clear that you want to do it uh, and see whether you get the permission from the examiner to do it. And also consider or predict or uh, anticipate potential questions while you are completing the examination, knowing uh, what you are likely to be asked, okay? 
So the opening sentence for presentation should convey to the examiners that you have elicited and interpreted you know, the key physical finding. You got the key physical findings and you follow the sentence too with additional information to back up your case. And you will emphasize the positive and important negative findings uh, not not a very, very long list of negative findings. I think that's uh, counterproductive. And you also suggest appropriate investigations when you uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, try to capture and maintain the attention of the examiners and make them want to continue to listen and engage in uh, further discussing uh, the case with you. Uh, I mentioned about differential diagnosis. Uh, get ready a few relevant differential diagnoses in a likely order and structured according to the patient's specific clinical findings, uh, the age, the gender, the ethnic origin, and uh, you know, uh, uh, accordingly list your differential diagnosis. Uh, and uh, communication, remember, is not just talking, but it's also talking, body gesture, and eye contact. So these are all the different things in uh, the communication. So don't uh, neglect on that. So, and uh, what you should do is, uh, you know, uh, if you are very confident of the diagnosis, it is more impressive to state the diagnosis first as to justify it by presentation of the relevant positive and negative physical sign. Uh, is rather than uh, giving a list of signs and then your diagnosis is better to confidently state the diagnosis if you are sure of it, you know, and that will be uh, much uh, better and more impressive. Uh, you also should anticipate, as I said, you know, anticipate questions that the examiner are likely to ask. There are actually many, not many things that the examiner can ask, but uh, you should uh, anticipate. When you answer the question that uh, being asked, it is very irritating to the examiners that you answer something else, not what the examiner is asking. Okay, I think that's that's all I have in terms of uh, tips uh, for the uh, candidates, and I'm uh, available for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Prof. Dr. Q. Um, it looks like we have some questions from the participants. Um, the first question from Wei Jun Li. For part one, do we have to be in clinical practice, for example, housemanship, in order to qualify to take the exam? Or can it be taken whilst waiting for housemanship? Uh, I believe uh, we can take it even though waiting for housemanship. But uh, the condition is you have to be at least 12 months after you completed your MBBS uh, in the medical school. Okay. Um, next question from Daphne. What is the difference between MRCP Island and MRCP UK in terms of its exam format and recognition in Malaysia? I think there is another uh, speaker, isn't it, going to talk about MRCP Island? Yes, there will be, um, it will be Dr. Tarmalingam at 11 a.m. So I will leave it to him to answer that. All right, okay. Um, from Kai Yang Lim, uh, what is the tips for parsing MRCP part one? How much time should we allocate for our daily revision? With what resources? I think, uh, you know, there are plenty of resources available. You know, just uh, for the simple fact that one time ago, a uh, long time ago, uh, in fact, we, we meaning uh, people who organize uh, all these uh, prep courses and mock exam and so on, were doing uh, prep courses for part one as well. But later on, it become very unpopular, meaning that uh, a lot of candidates actually uh, managed to find their online resources to uh, prepare themselves for the uh, part one. Because it's basically MCQs, you know, and reading about, uh, you know, how to how to tackle all the MCQ questions. You don't really need uh, uh, to attend courses. Lah. If there are courses, of course, it'd be good. Lah, but I think it became very unpopular. So we also stopped organizing uh, part one prep courses. Uh, so the short answer to it is a lot of resources are available, uh, you know, in the in the website. So if, and the other thing is, I will strongly advise you to form a group 
to study together. I have seen a lot of my you know, young doctors forming a, a group and uh, they sort of uh, have got a regular time to sit down and go through the MCQs. So that is my advice. Okay. Okay. Um, next question. How much time you would read? I think this is the same questions. How much time yeah. you would recommend for us to prepare prior taking pieces after passing part two? Actually, now uh, they, they make it so um, very liberal. Uh, in fact, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you can even do your part two or pieces even before you, part, you pass your part two A, you know. Uh, but Actually, it's a matter of your own, uh, you know, assessment of how prepared you are to do the paces. Uh. Paces, as I said, you have to have certain level of, um, of uh, clinical exposure and clinical experience. Uh. Uh, it's, it's better to take it when you're ready, but uh, not, uh, not too soon uh, if, uh, you, if you feel that you're not uh, ready. But as I said, uh, it is always good to have a group to... Uh, to, uh, to study together, to critique each other and to present to each other and so on, you know. Uh, the group is very important, I think. I've seen a lot of people who have done well, uh, uh, you know, from the group. Lah. The other thing is, uh, maybe I didn't emphasize enough, is uh, maybe you can hear it from the subsequent speaker, uh, like uh, Dr. Paras, lah, that uh, the uh, MRCP is an uh, entrance exam, it's not the exit exam. So even if you pass the uh, MRCP, you still have to go through the uh, four years of uh, training in internal medicine and in subspecialty. Okay. Okay. Next question: Is there any minimal clinical work experience needed prior signing up for PCS? Sorry. Is there any minimal clinical work experience before signing signing up for PCS? I, I don't think there is any uh, requirement. If you feel that you are ready, uh, you can sign up. There's no uh, requirement to say that you must have done so many uh, months or so many years and you must have done all the subspecialty. But as I mentioned earlier, that uh, even though you pass your MRCP, it's, it's an entrance exam. Uh, you will not be able to register with the National Specialist Register or NSR unless you've got four years of uh, training or uh, work experience in internal medicine and subspecialty. Uh, as well as passing the MRCP, either uh, UK or Irish. Uh, okay. I hope I make myself. Okay, from Jason Ting, could you please suggest some strategies to formulating a good differential diagnosis list? Oh, that is, uh, you know, your reading, your clinical experience, your working. Uh, and uh, nothing short of uh, practice and practice and practice uh, working in, uh, you know, in, uh, in the wards and so on. I don't think you can ever pass uh, paces without working in the wards. Uh. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, any recommended resources uh, or any workshops or training courses that you personally, personally recommend it? Unfortunately, the, uh, you know, we have got... Uh, uh, we used to uh, organize a lot of uh, PACES uh, prep course and PACES mock exam and all that. But because of the pandemic, it has not been uh, available for the last many months. But I think soon it will be coming back. Now because we also started back on the uh, PACES uh, exam uh, this, uh, this year itself, you know, uh, the uh, October, November, December. There are a few hospitals organizing it, including my, my hospital. So, uh, so soon, I think there'll be people who will be organizing more exam and uh, courses and so on. So just look around and uh, see whether you can uh, attend. And uh, there are a lot of resources in terms of books and so on. All, all you need to do is uh, check it on the uh, website. Huh? Uh, there are plenty of resources. Okay, there's not, no, no shortage of resources uh, getting you ready for the places. Yeah, but Practice, 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 see patients uh, and uh, get your group to help you uh, form a group and uh, you know, st study and learn together as a group. That, that is, uh, that is uh, a good strategy. Okay. I, I think it's very difficult to study on your own. Lah. I think basically that is what uh, we are trying to say. Lah, huh? 
Okay, um, I don't think we have any more questions uh, at the moment. Uh, but if you have uh, any further questions, you can just type in into the Q&A box and uh, Prof Q may type in the uh, answers later. Um, thank you very much, Prof Dr. Dr. Q, for taking some time to join us today. I'm sure participants now have better insights on MRCP examination. Okay, good. Next. Thank you. Thank you. Next. I'm delighted to introduce our second speaker, Datuk Seri Professor Dr. Paras Doshi. Datuk Seri is the President of Malaysian Advanced Acute Internal Medicine and Ultrasound Society and the Vice President of College of Physicians Malaysia. He is also the National Coordinator Parallel Pathway for Internal Medicine. He will be delivering his lecture on Overview of Parallel Pathway at Ministry of Health Malaysia. The floor is yours, Datuk Seri. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, thank you very much to Newcastle University Medicine Malaysia. Thank you very much, Professor Chris Baldwin, for having me here today to talk about the parallel pathway. Uh, thank you very much to Datuk Q. Uh, for those of you who may not know her, Datuk Q is a luminary when it comes to MRCP in Malaysia. In fact, uh, Datuk Q was one of the strong reasons uh, that got me involved in uh, training for the parallel pathway. And it was Datuk Q was instrumental in getting me in hospital scrum band for the MRCP exams. So thank you very much, Datuk Q. Uh, Sifu, you've heard from her. Uh, every wrinkle on her face is an indicator of the decades that she has had experience in examining MRCP. So every word that comes out from her is actually like a pearl. And what I will be doing right now for today will be building on what Datuk Q has done um, in terms of the parallel pathway. So without much further ado, I'll just share my screen. All right, uh, Shira, can you, is the screen visible? Yes, yes. Okay, all right. So parallel pathway, the way forward for internal medicine. So internal medicine, um, you can see the little guy there, the guy in white, all right? Uh, we always stand out from the rest of the crowd. And uh, if you have thought about internal medicine, I would first like to say congratulations to all the people who have logged in today. Either you are in need of uh, visiting a psychiatrist because you are you know, you're not sure what you want to do and you've chosen internal medicine as a suicidal thought after doing your MBBS, or congratulations, you have a lot of gray matter, all right? So it is only those who have a lot of gray matter and gray matter that is functional, right? Your neurons need to be firing continuously. Only then would you be eligible and only then will you be equipped to deal with internal medicine. Of course, no, Pun intended for the other subspecialties like orthopedics, surgery, um, regrets, uh, I, mean, um, I apologize, but I do believe that for internal medicine, you do need a substantial amount of functional gray matter. All right, so congratulations to all of you who are here today. Now, a lot of the appeal of internal medicine, of course, is Sherlockian. I believe you are here because you enjoy solving cases from clues. And I always say for internal medicine, we are detectives, all right? We revel in the process of figuring it all out. And it, I do believe it's what most doctors love to do. The reason why I say most is because some doctors don't like figuring it all out. They like everything on a plate for them, all right? They want the scans, they want the results, and then only they get involved. But some doctors, or rather most doctors, what we love to do is figuring it out, all right? So, uh, of course, uh, no, um, no reference to the other specialities, all right? I have to still go back to hospital tomorrow. I don't want the orthopedic doctor and the surgeons to be upset with us. But it's a process of figuring it all out, which is what defines internal medicine. So, for internal medicine, therefore, training is important. How do we ensure the next generation of physicians from the 1960s will continue in terms of learning and in terms of training. And it is essential that physicians hand over their skills and train the next generation. So whenever people talk about training, people always talk about service, all right? Uh, people want to go to the best hospital. People want to only go to a teaching hospital. That's not true. So what we always believe is that training and service, they're synergistic. If you are training, you are also learning. And if you're doing service to the public in the public hospitals, you are also learning and it is synergistic. So we always want to emphasize this point. 
that wherever you are doing service, you are actually training and wherever you are training, you're actually delivering service as well. So training improves patient care and clinical outcomes. That is definitely undeniable. If there's anything that I would like you to take home from today, it would be this slide. All right, screenshot it. Of course, you'll get a recording of the lecture, but this website has all the information that you would need for the parallel pathway from entrance requirements to exit requirements to training pathways to a list of eligible trainers. Everything is on this website. So I'm sure you all are feeling like this right now, isn't it? Internal medicine is so wide. What do we do? Based on the questions that were there on the forum just now, I am sure a lot of you are feeling, where do we start? What is it that we should be looking at right now? So I'm sure you all feel like the little cow that's under the hay, all right? The little cow looks very sad. Obviously, it looks like it's going to be squashed by the expectations. Everyone is worried about doing internal medicine. And I believe whenever you say internal medicine, automatically a very scary image comes to mind. Coming to work late at night, always being burdened with patients that others don't want to see, having to wade through the mess that others have created and basically cleaning up the, the fecal matter that other specialities leave behind, all right? That's what we are popularly referred to. But it's not as bleak as it looks at. So background, so internal medicine physicians, the good news is that you'll be forever required. If there's any speciality that is extremely required in the country, it will be physicians. So we need 4,420 physicians. So good news is if those of you who are worried, will I have a job in 10 years time? You will. All right, you will definitely be required and you will definitely be needed all over the country. So the parallel pathway program is also complementing the master's program that is already present in the country. Now, popular questions. So we've got the MRCP UK and the MRCP Ireland. We have very distinguished speakers. We have Professor Lechman speaking today. We have Professor Edmund speaking today and of course Dr. Tharmalingam. So I will just skim it from the surface. MRCP UK, of course, Royal College of Physicians UK, you have the part one at 12 months post MBBS. The main differing feature is that it is not online and the part two is also not online. And you have the PACES clinical exams. So you have three exams that are basically summative assessments. They're just looking at you in terms of a score. MRCP Island is the second part of the parallel pathway. So delivered by the Royal College of Physicians Island, so the part one at six months post-graduation MBBS is delivered online. The part two general medicine theory is also delivered online. And the part two general medicine clinical, however, is still face-to-face. -face. Now, due to the pandemic, all exams were temporarily disrupted for the years 2020 and 2021. But the news is good. As of this month, the exams have restarted for the MRCP UK. And in next year, the first quarter, there will be an MRCP Island general medicine clinical examination. So things are going. And the MRCP Island also offers the option to take the exams online. Now, we have the parallel pathway that's being offered by the Ministry of Health, but it's also important to let you know that there is a master's program that's being done by the conjoint board, whereby the Ministry of Health partners various institutions in the country. There's an entrance examination, which is MEDEX, which is conducted by the local examinations board. That will be your first exam. Um, after that, you will also have another examination, clinical examination at year three, which involves both theory and clinical. So that's a, just a brief touch on the master's program. So the current status, as I told you, you are in good, uh, you are in luck we will require a huge number of physicians for the entire country, including subs. Now, a very important question that you all may have today. Most of you may be contract doctors. And for those of you who are still medical students, and for those of you who are house officers, all of you will probably be on a contract. So how does a parallel pathway fit in for contract doctors? It is important to know that the MOH is working on a system to offer extended contracts to those who are specializing, meaning that if you plan 
to pursue internal medicine and all you need to do is to get the part one done you will be offered an extended contract now of course this is being worked up by the ministry of health and jpa and further details on this will be given out once it is finalized but in my mind this would be the best opportunity for you to continue service because you are already in a sub-specializing training program. My advice to you, get on the train as soon as possible. Get the part one done and register for the parallel pathway so that you are now a trainee undergoing internal medicine specialization. These are the numbers, just ad hoc, all right? So you can see that we are training approximately in the parallel pathway, 240 per year are passing out, and it goes to a great way in ensuring that physicians are there to meet the needs of the country. Now, for the parallel pathway, we have a national committee, state and regional representatives, that also overlook state committees that are responsible for training, they overlook the hospitals in turn. And of course, you have the trainers. We also have a small coordinating committee. So this is just giving an overview of the parallel pathway committee structure. At the bottom, you can see every physician is actually a trainer at heart. Very important question you will ask today. Parallel pathway, how long? La? Is it one year, three years, five years? So of course, even if you are Dr. House, even if you are the most brilliant physician the world has ever seen, even if you are the offspring of Sir Harvey Cushing, you will still have to train for four years. All right, it's 48 months of training. That's a very important number for you to take home today, 48 months. That is how long the parallel pathway training program is. It is no longer dependent on how fast you clear your exams. The focus is no longer on summative assessments or the MRCP examinations because those are just summative assessments. What is more important is how you will train over those four years or 48 months of training. In that 48 months of training, we expect that you should clear your part one and part two and paces. So do not panic. Do not be kiasu like our neighbors down south to get the MRCP paces done, the faster you do it, the better it is. No, as long as you do it within the 48 months, you will be considered through. Now, if HSBC is the world's local bank, our parallel pathway also has to have a lot of heterogeneity because the hospitals are different. The training supervisors are different. And of course, we needed a system that can function in both HKL or even Penang as an urban center, or even in a small center like Kapit or Guamusa. So the parallel pathway program has been devised so that it can function equally well in whichever hospital you may be. So do not robot robot to go to HKL or Penang or for that matter, Johor Bahru. Now, for the parallel pathway, our emphasis is more on training and learning exposure rather than rotations. So it is not necessary for you to go by rotations in the hospitals. This is something that's very important. Many people are worried if I am in hospital Jrantut or if I am in hospital Kapit, I don't have rotations. How will I learn? We look at supervised learning events or supervised learning exposure. As long as you have supervision, and if you are seeing the cases, it's very good. An example would be if you were seeing a myocardial infarction, an MI, in a very, very advanced hospital, like for example, Hospital Saddam, you may only see the patient at diagnosis, or you may see the patient at discharge. But in a smaller hospital, you will actually see the patient throughout your exposure. So in fact, it might even be more advantageous to be in a smaller hospital where you will see the patient from admission until discharge and you will get a 360 exposure on how to handle these cases. Every hospital is able to provide training for the parallel pathway. 
So service and training will be delivered wherever needed. And do remember, whichever hospital you are part of, you are actually part of a cluster. So you do not need to uproot medical officers. So for those of you who have families or for those of you who are settled, the best news is that you will not need to move significantly. Perhaps you may need to go to a specific hospital for a rotation. But otherwise, by large, you will be trained where you are and you will benefit from the admission till discharge hands-on management. Now, we have a unified calendar now, and this unified calendar, of course, is like a black hole. Nobody knows when do you join a parallel pathway, when do you learn? So we have four quarterly intakes and exits. They occur in January, April, July, and October. So you will be lumped into cohorts, and each cohort will commence every three months, and it allows you to basically create a community of practice. You are in one group, and you'll be basically together for that four years. So this is easier because it is very difficult for hospitals to plan when you have trainees entering the program ad hoc. So it will allow streamlining of meetings for placements as well. Now, let's talk about the flow of assessments and reports. How does the parallel pathway program work? So again, it is a black hole. All right, uh, basically no information ever comes out. No one knows what's happening in internal medicine training. So let's shed some light. So let's be like the Spartans, all right? It's not easy, all right, but let's prepare for war. Let's prepare for the assessments and reports that we will need. So like this king in Sparta, no matter what is ahead, you soldier on and you get done with the 48 months of training. So this is a brief overview you will enter with the part one MRCP UK or MRCP Ireland. That is the most important part. Once you clear your part one, you will then be assigned a training ID. You will be given logbooks and you'll be assigned a hospital coordinator and a mentor. All right. Do you also have summative assessments and you also have formative assessments? Summative assessments are looking at your examinations. Formative assessments are looking at assessments that you do at the workplace. You will have lots of reports, three months, six months. There's a case exposure log whereby you log in the cases that you see. There's also a research component. Now the research component can be a very simple study, a simple publication, even a simple QA audit that will count to your research component. All right. And after which you will then submit your logbook and process for gazettement. So gazettement is six months after the parallel pathway training program. All right. Now, so the portfolio, this is what you will have to give at the end of your training program. You will have your posting details, your trainer details. You have a case exposure, a procedure log. You have to give that verified. You have your workplace based assessments, which are refer letters, mini CX, multi-source feedback, CBD and DOPS. Now, I will not run through these details because those are all basically workplace-based assessments. So what you need to know is that there'll be assessments that will be carried out at the workplace. You also have reports from your mentors, from your hospital coordinator, from your head of department, all right? And these will be filled in on a regular basis. And of course, you have a research component that needs to be fulfilled. If you're going to do your basic life support or ACLS, that needs to be filled in as well, all right? So... At that point in time, if you've done any ultrasound exposure or echocardiography, it can be logged in. And finally, you have your summative assessments record, which is your MRCP part one, part two, and the basis. Now, this is just a quick overview. You can see that everything has been planned out. Many people feel that the parallel pathway does not have structure, but in fact, it does have structure. You have your assessments that are due. You have to do your reports every three to six months. You have your mentor meeting that carries out. So everything has been structured in a proper way for you. How do we register? So all the information that you require is available on the KKM website, moh.gov.my. And also, as always, the same links can be found in the website, www.parallelpathway.gov.my. Now, once you join the program, we'll be briefing you every quarter, all right? We will have state level trainings for those who are entering per cohort and also the hospital level where necessary for reinforcement. 
the basic idea is that you will not be left like sheep without a shepherd. We will be there to guide you along the parallel pathway. So in a parallel pathway, it has to be flexible. Remember, it has to be like HSBC. How do we train in HKL versus Lahat Tattu? So if you're in a major hospital, that's you when you join the program, what you need to do is you need to meet your hospital coordinator, who will then introduce you to the head of the department, and you will be assigned a mentor. Your mentor will say, you know what, let's go to the most garan posting, nephrology. So you go to nephrology, you meet the consultant, you meet the specialist, the trainees will be there, the consultants will be there, the general specialists will be there, the head of department may come to the ward, of course, your training supervisor will be there, your mentor will be there. The idea is that they are all trainers and they all will be involved in assessing you and training you, every one of them. After which you may go to a nicer posting like gastro. So in gastro, again, you will have the specialists, the subspecialist trainees, the consultants and the general specialists, and they're all trainers for you. And this is how you do it if you were in a big hospital. What if you were in a minor hospital? Again, when you come in, you must meet your hospital coordinator, your head of department and mentor. And they will now send you to a ward because there are no subspecialties there. In the ward, all these people will again be training and they will be your trainers, all right? After you finish this ward, you might go to the next ward. And when you meet the next ward again, if you're in a smaller hospital, they will all be responsible for training you. They're all trainers at the end of the day. Most important question now, what if I'm in Lahadatu? So if you're in Lahadatu or if you're in a hospital Sarike, you, head, you meet the head of department who also happens to be your mentor, who also happens to be your training supervisor. And that particular person will also be your trainer. So basically that person will be multitasking, but will be involved in your training. We have more than 600 trainers from all over the country. So we have sufficient mentor-mentee in terms of a mentor-mentee ratio. We are sufficient in terms of a trainer-trainee ratio. And this will be available in a live sheet that's been updated and is on the website as well. We have been doing training of the trainer sessions all over the country for 2019 and 2020. And this will also be used to bring the trainees up to speed. And we will be repeating a session for this year in December. Remember that we have revalidation for all our trainers to make sure that standards are also met. Anyone can be a trainer, all right? Any physician in any hospital will be a trainer for you. So do not worry if you do not have a particular specialty in your hospital. So as mentioned, the head department can be a trainer, your coordinator will be a trainer, training supervisor will be a trainer, mentor will be a trainer. The take home message for you all is that all these trainers have been assigned roles and they are all aware of what they need to do in terms of training. Important thing to take home today, entrance criteria. You need to clear your part one, MRCP UK or MRCP Ireland, and you must have a letter of good conduct from your head of department. And your score for your LNPT must be more than 80% to join the parallel pathway. Now, let's suppose it becomes more competitive in the future, all right? There may be additional criteria that will come in. And of course, these criteria are not yet in place, but looking at the future, looking at trends in other countries, we will have to eventually decide if we do not have enough training posts. We might want to look at your CV. We might want to see where have you been working and we might often give weightage to smaller hospitals because you have been serving the Ministry of Health there. And of course, LNPT score, the greater the score, the better it will be. I would like to stress that these criteria are not in place, but it is wise to think of trends that are coming in the future and be prepared from now. Research exposure and posters, definitely those with greater research exposure will be looked at more favorably. Exit criteria, you need to clear all parts of the MRCP UK and Ireland. But just because you cleared the exams does not mean that you will exit. You must also do your formative assessments. You must also complete your logbook for cases and procedures. And your score must be maintained at more than 85% throughout the training duration. You must do your research component. 
And yes, please, no disciplinary or ethical issues during the training process. And we must have a final mentor report whereby two consultants will sign off for you as being competent to be a physician. Your logbook will be verified at the State Regional Council meeting. This is just an overview of the various workplace-based assessments that you can use for yourselves during the 48 months. So we do have mini CX, we have case-based discussion. The idea is that this is a very structured program. These assessments are there with forms to be filled up as you do your training program. These are the numbers that will be required. So it has been already been outlined how many you need in terms of qualification. For the case-based discussion, you will need 12, one from each subspeciality, mini CX, DOPS, referral letters, and of course, multi-source feedback. Now, before I leave, this is something that I'd like to stress for you. So it's very important for us to have our priorities straight. If you're interested right now in enjoying life and uh, you probably want to take a bit of time, it's not correct. While your knowledge is fresh from your MBBS, get your part one done. Clear the part one, join the parallel pathway and register as a subspeciality trainee for internal medicine. That would be the most important thing that you should do on your plate right now. And after you clear your part one, you should be focusing on getting your logbooks and starting the workplace-based assessments. So these are all uh, training rules, which I shall not go through today, all right? But you can definitely, all this that I'm showing you right now is on the website and all this can be assessed on the website, all right? So I will not go through this for now because this is information that you will get once you join the Parallel Pathway Training Program. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, all right? Uh, I'll be more than happy to take questions. Thank you very much. That is very. Um, we have questions from Jun Jun Hang Lee. I think you covered this uh, during your presentation earlier about the contract system getting into parallel pathway. Uh, would you like to add anything to this question? Um, yeah, no. The MRCP Island, and MRCP UK, definitely it differs in terms of the final assessment. What I would like to stress on is for Wei Jun Lee for the part one. Do we have to be in clinical practice? Um, you can be a houseman and you can do the part one examination, but you can only register for the parallel pathway once you have cleared your part one and you have become a medical officer. That is when the clock starts for the 48 months. All right. So it's very important for you to make sure that your part one and that you're an MO to join and register for the parallel pathway. And the date that you register for the parallel pathway is the date that the form gets sent to the secretariat and it must get accepted for the cohorts after which you will have an interview to assess your aptitude and your attitude for training in postgraduate internal medicine. Okay, uh, Dr. Sri, um, second questions on the current contract system getting into parallel pathway. Do you have any other advice or suggestion? For uh, basically now they're asking um, for the parallel pathway is quite straightforward. You just need to get your part one done as an MO and register. Once you're in the parallel pathway, you'll be taken care of because there will be training of the trainer sessions, training of the trainee sessions, and you'll be guided by the your hospital coordinator on what assessments need to be done. Um, the uh, another question that was asked that I saw here was. Um, any minimal, minimal clinical work experience needed for signing up to the PACES? The answer is no. Um, you do not need a minimal clinical work experience. Of course, as part of the PACES form, you probably might need your consultant to sign off for you. But now the PACES, the part one, part two, they can be done at any point in time in the four years of your clinical training. So basically, we want to stop people from thinking that the PACES is the final part of your program. It's not. You still have 48 months. We do have trainees who do all the exams in the first one year and they're done, but they still have to go through the balance of the 48 months to complete their internal medicine training. Without completion of the 48 months, even if you have your paces or you've completed your MRCP Island, you cannot proceed for gazettement as an internal medicine physician. And the parallel pathway is currently being offered to hospitals within the Ministry of Health only. 
Um, so there's another question from June. Um, does the current contract system withhold us from getting into the parallel pathway? Uh, it does not. And I would advise you, if you're a contract MO, please sign up for the part one, get it done and join the parallel pathway. Because at least once in the parallel pathway, you have four years of training ahead of you and you are more valuable to the ministry than a train than a contract doctor who is not in any training program. We would definitely value those who show commitment to advance, who show a desire to improve themselves and are already in the parallel pathway. So the parallel pathway registration is probably your best chance of getting your contract extended and hopefully eventually turning into a permanent post. Uh, Dr. Sri, uh, we're yeah. running out of time. Uh, can we have one last question uh, for you to address today? Yes, definitely. Oh, I just saw the other questions. Uh, yes, the open I registered, question. I, I thought you answered once. Okay, registered yeah. myself parallel pathway. I took up the HLP offer. Do I still need to complete the parallel pathway logbook in this case? If you yes. take up the HLP pathway for master's in internal medicine, that means you are in the master's program. Uh, the parallel pathway program, you will still have to fulfill the requirements. So you still need a parallel pathway logbook completed. Yes. Marwan, uh, may I know how to proceed for those who are MRCP exam working in private universities? So at the moment with private universities, they're not registered in the parallel pathway yet, but we are working with private universities to recognize your work exposure. Talks are ongoing with University of in Malaysia uh, for their trainees as well as UM to make sure that they are parallel path, uh, to make sure that they are eligible to at least register under the parallel pathway. After the exam, does it mean that you need to be registered in the NSR or can you use MRCP's entrance exam? For master program so yes the mrcp part one is considered uh, as an entrance exam for the master's program in local university but for nsr you must complete either MMED or you must complete your mrcp only then can you be eligible for registration in the nsr after six months of gazettement what's the difference between parallel pathway and master's program in terms of exam and structure uh this will require a lot of a uh, uh, discussion it's similar they're both 48 months uh training programs the, the way you do the training may be different, but at the end of the day, you will still uh, get to the same point in terms of knowledge and in terms of skills. Uh, last question, um, is there a possibility of having paper being sent to medical different other than medical departments as MO? This because original placement will usually be applied before and paper one being sent to different departments. No, you have to do your paper, you do your part one, wherever you are, in whichever hospital you are, whichever department you are, it doesn't matter. And once you get your part one done, you'll be given priority to go to a hospital rather than being sent to a KK. All the state departments have already had a surat percolating issue whereby you will be going to a hospital for training. Um, applies for trainees in public uni hospitals, public university hospitals, not yet. MOH hospitals, yes, public uni on the way in work. Can we sit for the part one after graduating MBBS but not starting husbandship? Yes, you can. Can we choose which hospital we want to have our training for MRCP pathway? No, but whichever hospital you go to, you will be going to a hospital that will be able to cater to your training in the part one. Uh, may I inquire the difference in parallel pathway master? That's done study break before exam in masters. Uh, you will get study breaks from your Ketua Jabatan. You will definitely, Budi Bichara, you can get a break. Remember, you're not studying for an exam. You're studying throughout the four years. Last question, Brian. What's your opinion for working in KKM district or teaching hospitals? Any preference for that? Ryan, my honest advice, KKM, any hospital, district or tertiary is good. MOE is also good as in terms of a teaching hospital, but MOE is not catered for in the parallel pathway right now. So if I have to choose something that is safe, I'll definitely go for a tertiary hospital or a district hospital. Both of them will be able to offer you training that caters to your parallel pathway. All right. Okay, that's so fast, Dr. Suri. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Suri, uh, Dr. Paras. Uh, okay, for addressing Thank you the very questions. Much for and, as well for yes, giving the opportunity. Welcome. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll now go for a short break before going into the next masterclass on tips to excel MRCP. See you shortly at 10.20 a.m.
Welcome back everyone. We are now on the second part of the masterclass session today. Please join me in welcoming our next speaker, Professor Dr. G. R. Lechuman Ramanadan, the President of College of Physicians Malaysia. Professor Dr. Lechuman is also a fellow at Academy Medicine Malaysia and a professor of medicine at Monash University Malaysia. Professor Dr. Lechuman will deliver the next talk entitled Common Pitfalls and Mystics Done for MRCP. Over to you, Prof. Uh, thank you, Shira, for the kind introduction. And uh, I'd like to thank the uh, Newcastle University for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to talk to so many people at the same time. Uh, I will start sharing my slides. Okay, the topic uh, given to me was common pitfalls and mistakes done for MRCP. Um, now, just to let you know, <clears throat> I will concentrate a lot on the PACES exams <clears throat> because as far as the part one and part two A, it's a matter of um, going on to the many resources online and even in books on uh, past year questions or similar to past year questions and trying it out and knowing why you got a particular uh, <clears throat> statement correct or, or wrong. So that is just pure practice. It's better to do it together with colleagues. And so when you have the uh, discussion as to why a particular statement is, is correct or not, or the best answer, not the best answer, you will remember. You remember based on your discussion. So that's the way to do the <clears throat> part one and part uh, 2A. Now, the contents of my talk will first be the, you know, to look at the macro picture, what is the objective of the PACES exams? And then I'll go through <clears throat> what I think is the reasons for failing, the common pitfalls, some of it, and mistakes, and how to minimize the <clears throat> risk of failing. Of course, there are many, many uh, examiners for the PACES, and they are all over the world. There are, you know, each one of us will have different experiences, but there are some common issues. So a disclaimer, uh, all that I say is my own opinion, it's not an official opinion, and it's based on, on several years of me uh, examining and observing what has happened. <clears throat> now, the main objective, if you even see on the website of the uh, MRCP PACES exam, is to test the clinical knowledge and skills of trainee doctors who hope to enter higher specialist training. In other words, for you to become a specialist. It's not an exit exam, as has been mentioned before. It's a sort of an entrance exam. And basically, it tests your competence across a range of skills that Prof. Q uh, uh, has showed earlier, and that you've already uh, uh, reached or ready to provide a high standard of care to patients. Now, at the end of the day, in the examiner's mind, and you know, marks you is that would I trust this candidate to run my ward in my absence? So, so that is something uh, that we all think as examiners, and something that you need to know as well. This has been shown earlier: the seven clinical skills uh, in eight patient encounters, and they are assessed by. 10 examiners. There are two examiners at every station. And there's one thing I like about the must be UK PACES because there are two examiners who mark independently. Um, and hence, it is fair. Uh, uh, you, there's always an avenue if you think you've been unfairly marked to question, and then they will look at the independent uh, uh, marks of their examiners to see whether there's a discordance. So it's a very fair exam. Again, this has been shown, the skills assessed. And here I've written on my right, uh, the number of assessment in each station. Um, and on my left is the skills assessed at the different um, stations. Again, you'll notice that 
most number of opportunities for assessment is in station five, which means uh, that that station itself contributes to 32.5% of the, all the marks in the uh, PACES exam. And hence, is some, if you have limited time to practice, then that is the station that you need to practice a lot. Again, this is the marking scheme. On, on, on the uh, third row is the uh, maximum marks that you can get in every station. And the final is a total of 172. So if somebody is flawless, you can actually get 172 over 172. Now, the, the, do not think that no one has achieved it. I, I know in the past there's one person who actually, uh, one or two persons who actually got total full 172, it's possible. Um, each uh, judgment call, each assessment uh, is worth four marks because there are two marks by each examiner. As you know, as explained by the Tokyo, there is either zero, uh, one or two. Two is satisfactory, um, uh, zero is unsatisfactory and, and uh, one is borderline mark. Now, the next point that by looking at this that you need to remember is that you need to achieve a minimum of 130 marks to pass the whole exam. This is one major criteria. You notice that this is not half of 172. It's about 76% of 172. So you cannot afford to get borderline marks all the time. You will not make it. Um, the, the other point to make is that maintaining patient self uh, welfare is extremely important. The pass mark is 88% or oh, that is 28 of 32. You must get minimum of 28. There's very little leeway to make a mistake here, but normally, as mentioned earlier, most candidates, they act it out well and they don't cause major patient welfare issues, as in like causing severe pain, uh, making the patient uncomfortable, um, or you know, asking for an investigation that's really invasive investigation that's not needed and so on or patient safety issue. So uh, usually it doesn't happen. Most of you do okay here. The next point I want to make is that the um, lowest in terms of the uh, pass mark as part of the maximum mark is in identifying physical signs and clinical judgment. And you have also seen that this is where many uh, candidates uh, also do not make it. Now, there's more leeway, like in other words, compared to maintaining patient welfare. There's more leeway to not get maximum marks. Uh, then, in other words, the pass mark is only 58% to 59% of the total maximum marks. Again, I mentioned there are two examiners with separate marking and they calibrate beforehand. And this part is emphasized to to the examiners that you must calibrate. For example, if there is a cardiovascular uh, case, you must agree what are the you know, three or four or five signs that must be there. And then they will agree. If you get four out of the five signs, then uh, you will then be okay for the identifying physical signs. And for um, judgment call, what are the points in the management, one, two, three, four, that must be mentioned. So if all I mentioned, you get the maximum two. If you, some, are, some are left out, then you get one. So this is decided between the two uh, examiners. So that's what we call uh, calibration. And there's another uh, sort of a test on the examiners. They are looked for their concordance at the end of the exam. So even though we agree on a calibration before the exam, we must maintain it throughout so that at the end, when the concordance is auto-calculated, it is satisfactory. You cannot simply mark. Again, this makes the whole exam more fair. Now, as I mentioned earlier, one will not pass if you do not get the overall minimum mark, pass mark of 130. Um, 
out of the maximum 172. Remember, there are 43 total assessment points, and this is by two examiners, each carrying two marks. So that's why it works out to a maximum of 172. So you think about it, you probably need to have 44 twos and 44 ones to reach 130. Uh, why they are uh, 44 and 42? Because they're two examiners. Huh? And then the other reason not to pass is fail to get the minimum mark in one of the seven skills. So remember, in this exam, you do not fail a station. This is important to remember because if you think you did not answer well in the station, don't get flustered. You do not fail a station. You fail a skill or you do not get the overall pass mark of 150. Even if you think you do not, did not do well in a particular station, just carry on because it's not station-based. So my reason why some candidates fail is that, you know, they perceive that they did not answer well in a particular station, did not answer a particular question well, or did not get a particular sign well. So because of that one, then after that, it seems to be a roller coaster downfall. You, you lose confidence uh, and then you do badly. That's one reason why some candidates do not make it. Um, the other is you are truly not ready. There are, you know, when we look at the scores at the end, some people do poorly on identifying physical science, poorly on clinical judgment or differential diagnosis. So that will actually mean that you've not, you're not ready yet and there's inadequate clinical exposure. Now, many are nervous. I think some anxiety or some nervousness is good because it puts you on your adrenaline and you perform better. But do not be too nervous because when you, you're really trembling and you're not speaking well, speaking softly, then you're not one person that I would want to consult when I get sick. Okay, I will give you some uh, examples of where it was not done perfectly. Um, so this may entail a uh, uh, point of one or even zero. Remember, you don't fail a station, so none of these are fatal mistakes where you fail the whole exam. Uh, they are just triggers, maybe, of the roller coaster downfall. Remember this. I think there's one message I want to tell you is that this exam is not dependent on one station. It's a composite of all the stations, and you might have to pass every skill. Of course, the welfare one, there's little um, leeway to make a mistake, but then most candidates do not make any mistakes under the welfare. Okay, one is under A, unsystematic uh, physical examination. You know, uh, let's say there's a patient whose the stamp is says, uh, this patient uh, is complaining of double vision, please examine and find the cause. Now, if you certainly start your examination doing the whole neurological examination of upper limb and lower limb, and then you do a general, and then you go to the face. It does not look like you are on, you know your job. You know, you, you are doing a standard practice without thinking through. It doesn't seem systematic. I would expect someone to um, maybe do a general examination, uh, note whether there's any third nerve palsy, whether there's any ptosis, uh, uh, make sure the visual uh, acuity is okay before you do a, uh, 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 eye movements and visual feel and uh, look to see at the pupils um, and uh, finally test for, you know, uh, uh, sweating to see whether it's uh, on honor syndrome. So that's more systematic. You, you know what you're looking for. And then you can look for, let's say, whether any other signs by doing a you know, looking at the other systems, if there's time. Uh, another case that comes to my mind um, is a patient who had, you know, the stamp is shortness of breath, find the cause. And then you come up with the diagnosis of CCF because you heard some uh, crepitations at the bases, but you also made up a sign, invent a sign that the JP is up. So that's, when actually the patient had the JP not raised, he had cross uh, clubbing 
and it was a Velcro-like uh, crepitations at the basis. So it's actually interstitial lung disease, but you made a diagnosis of CCF. So you will lose out on identifying physical signs, you will lose out on differential diagnosis, and you will lose out on judgment. So in one mistake, you can lose as much as 24 months. So see how the system uh, works. I also noticed that, you know, this has happened over and over again. Some patients have mixed upper and lower motor neuron signs, and then you get flustered as to what is the cause. As you know, they are, you know, like motor neuron disease can have both. And some patients may have a peripheral neuropathy due to, say, diabetes and as well as CVA. So there may be reasons and you should be able to explain like a specialist. The other big no-no is causing pain. Now, if you examine the uh, abdomen while looking at the patient's face rather than at the, your hands on the abdomen, we know that you care. And I think that would be uh, uh, good. Uh, then with regards to communication, and some of you have a haphazard way of um, asking uh, history. Let's say it's a patient who came in uh, with chest pain uh, and then you uh, start asking about the chest pain. But then with regards to risk factors for ischemic heart disease, you bring it on later rather than ask during the history of present illness. So not so coordinated for the patient in front of you. You may not get a full two. Uh, neither will you get zero. Okay. Um, then there may be a you know, possibility of a patient who had syncope, for example, and then you miss the past history of uh, benign prostatic hypertrophy and the patient was recently started on alpha blocker and that was the cause of it because you didn't take a, a good enough past history, you didn't do a good system review, you missed the whole diagnosis and the differential diagnosis. Then another one that comes to my mind is, you know, how patients uh, sort of say, uh, you know, there are, there are problems they have. You know, when you ask about, you know, any sexual practices. And if let's say somebody was just to say, my sin was uh, having women, but you, you know, you heard it as, as sin, as in S-E-E-N, and then misunderstood the whole thing without clarifying uh, that may go. So this is part of your printal communication. You're not sure you need to come to check. Uh, then inappropriate words or manner or asking or response. You know, some of you will go, and say, oh, that's good, that's good, that's good to everything. To, to some extent, um, that sounds judgmental. And then if let's say he says, I, uh, I smoke for the past 20 years, and then you cannot use the word that's good and you say, oh, it's like judgmental. So you need to know how to ask questions um, in a neutral manner, so they don't get caught in this kind of situations. And then you notice here there is marks of differential diagnosis and some of you just do not give a uh, differential, you just come with one diagnosis. You can mention the rest that are possible but less likely and give your reasons why it's less likely rather than not mention it. Sometimes it may help you, maybe that one of the differentials is actual diagnosis. And this happens because you are not reading the scenarios in full and planning dual uh, in the five minutes. In the five minutes is for you to uh, plan it out. Like, for example, if the patient has a problem of chronic uh, diarrhea, then, you know, there are major causes of uh, chronic diarrhea and you need to, you know, have a, a mnemonic to remember them all, whether it's infective, whether it's connective tissue disease, malignancies, or psychological, you need to cover them all. Okay, the other thing to uh, note that if once the diagnosis is completely wrong, you probably will not get any marks for differential diagnosis and judgment unless it's also in the differential. Then there's some saving grace. Again, notice F huh? in some of the stations you have concerns. And if you do not ask the concern, and sometimes there are more than one concern, huh? and if you do not ask it, you're wasting the mark. And very often it may be related to the medication. And usually patients are told and they have a list of medications they have, and that will give you a lot of clues as to the diagnosis or the concerns of the patient. As mentioned earlier, inventing signs will be looked at as uh, negative. There was a patient, a cardiac case, I remember, 
you know, it was put to us that this patient has mitral leakage. However, both me and my co-examiner examined it very well and we agreed there was no pan-systolic murmur radiating to the axilla. There was a click as well as there was injection systolic murmur. We both agreed on it. But many candidates came and say, oh, there's a pan-systolic, I don't know why, but you know, they seem to want to put it together. There's a pan-systolic murmur radiating to the axilla and hence it's mitral leakage. Um, so they won't get a two, that's for sure. But there's one candidate I remember said, you know, I was, you know, because of the cardiomegaly, I thought this patient had mitral uh, regurg, but then I could not actually get a pan-systolic murmur radiated to the, to the axilla and there was just um, uh, 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 injection systolic murmur. I just wonder whether this is a mitral valve prolapse going on to something more severe. Uh, and that person got two because she was honest and she spoke like a specialist, highlighting what was not there uh, and not making it up. So in the many years that I've examined her, just to let you know, in this exam, there's no trick question or trick patient, there's none. And for the skill G on patient welfare, I can't remember, maybe there's one over the many years where there was two unsatisfactory scores. Um, I think it was for, you know, going along a, a, a management plan that was unsafe for the patient. So uh, again, if your physical signs are not found, then it's unlikely that you'll get marked for differential diagnosis and clinical judgment. Uh, unless you had a good differential diagnosis, then perhaps in some saving grace, you may get one for the other two as well. So this is very important for you all to understand the system, how it works. So the following things may be marked under judgment of patient welfare. If you are suggesting a drug, the patient has clearly told you that, you know, it's allergic to say he's, he's allergic to the penicillin group of drug and then you are suggesting one in that same group, then it's a patient safety issue. Uh, or you are suggesting an unindicated invasive procedure, the person has stable in China. And then you say this patient must undergo uh, angiogram, then it's not appropriate. Now, I think this is my final slide. Examiners are humans, okay? I mean, we are looking for the candidate to show good impressions. And the first impression is important. You first come in, appropriately dressed. No one is failed because of the way they are dressed. Now, but, you know, the first impressions, are important. Uh, so, you know, if you are decently dressed as you normally do for your normal ward round, that'll be good. Uh, say your good mornings, greet the patients, greet the examiners. Be cool and be confident. Um, right from the start, that's important. Be smooth in your history taking as well in your physical examination. Uh, speak clearly. If you speak for softly and we have to say, yeah, I wanted to say that again, then it's an indication that you're not sure. True modesty, uh, do not um, overact. Some of you do that, you know, like I gave you the example, oh, good, oh, good, oh, good for the patient. And then when there's something negative, you say, oh, as though there's a judgment call. So if you are cool, confident, speak smoothly uh, and, and clearly, then we know that you respect your patients and you've done it a million times and you can be trusted. So I will stop here uh, and we'll, we'll be willing to take uh, questions. Thank you very much, Prof. Lechman, for the very informative presentation. Um, at the moment, we don't receive any Q&A. Uh, but participants can actually still enter the Q&A if you have any further questions and Prof. Lech uh, will be able to answer it via the Q&A box. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Lechuman. Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Tharma Lingam Palanivelu, the Joint Regional Advisor of Royal College of Physicians Island. Dr. Tharma Lingam will now be speaking on the topic MRCPI Island Pathway to Internal Medicine. The floor is yours, Dr. Uh, Dr. You are muted.
Yeah, well, good morning and welcome uh, to all of you. And thanks for giving me a chance in this uh, masterclass. And uh, thanks to NewMed and the organizers. Um, let me share my. Uh, so before that, a uh, few words. Mine, uh, mostly my lecture or whatever my webinar is, is for the those who are M MO, junior MOs, those who are fresh graduates, and also for those who are going to take up uh, part one examination. And um, I'm going to mainly talk about Royal College of Physicians part one examination of Ireland. Uh, let me share the slides with you. Okay. So what I'm going to do today uh, uh, about uh, uh, career pathway plan in MOH and master in this master class webinar, and uh, we can I mainly will talk about how to take a part one uh, uh, in I I island paper, how to go about it, and uh, so on. So as we go on, um, let's go to the next slide. Well. Uh, what uh, most of you are students now in final year, I believe, and uh, what you may be in a final year, maybe alumni and maybe a junior MO and fresh graduates. Okay. And what I'm suggest is uh, nowadays the MRCP part one is, uh, can be start very early, try to start somewhere early, something worthwhile during a job posting, houseman waiting period itself, and continue your career pathway. Uh, as a as a physician or as a surgeon, all that. Uh, uh, why you're posting as HO two years plus one uh, one year plus one two years, almost it is uh, two years. Your HO posting and is under contract, and then you need to be appointed as MO, maybe under contract or permanent post in MOH. All right. You can do something as stepping stone for your future career. Okay. Now, as a final year student, you may know what to study. You may not know. Uh, I'm not even HO yet. Uh, how to know before HO posting what I like to be physician, surgeon, gynae. You may ask me that. Okay. Too soon for you to, you know, put into MRCP part one uh, to be a physician. All right. What I, we uh, know is in surveys, uh, most of the uh, surveys we have done uh, to a medical student or final year. 25% already developed ambition to be physician before entering in medical college. If they want to be cardiologist, neurologist, and nephrologist, raspy, dermatology, etc. And 25 decide after the graduation of medical college uh, what they want to feel, a surgical field, or medical field, or other fields, uh, gynae, etc. 30 decide during HO posting. So if you're all HO or alumni, all that, please, uh, most, most of you just after graduation or uh, decide during the houseman posting. Then 50% decides on MO posting and 5%, I think they stay as never knows group. Uh, we not, we no need to go further on that because there will be another 5% who are very late and then decide late all that. So, so MRCPI, I learned stages, part one written, we have 100 uh, best of five, and basically it's a basic medical sciences, some clinical questions, it's a three hour paper only. Part two, return, more clinical questions will be there and it's a five hours paper uh, combined 2.5 each, uh, two papers. Part two, clinical, conducted twice a year in Malaysia and five to six times in other centers, including the Ireland and Middle East. So what we are suggesting is prepare for the part one MRCP paper just in waiting period or HO posting. 
as a fresh graduate or as a houseman or as a junior MO itself to register as a trainee under the MOH as a parallel pathway so that you are given four to seven years to complete your studies to be a specialist. You can take up the part one exam after six months of graduation, completing undergraduate exam. So therefore, once you finish your part one for the RCPR, I mean, once you finish your graduation, uh, after six months, while waiting for your show posting, you take and take up the part one. Nowadays, uh, the HOs are coming up with the part two completed. You know, so, so we are moving very fast as MRCP is an entrance exam to be a specialist. Okay, if you have the part one paper of medicine, definitely it will help you in your HO posting as you are better HO, you know some basics, some of the clinicals, and you go do well in HO posting. So you are well equipped while waiting period for the HO posting. Don't waste your time. I think something you have already decided with a physician, please carry on the part one pathway during waiting period of housemanship, at least at the period of houseman itself. Okay, so it helps you to prolong your contract as a specialist, another four to six, four to six years in MOH. And MOH, you know, is the largest training facility now. So it will give you time, you know, to be a, a not only a, a me medical officer, but, you know, as you train, you become, you're going to be specialist four to six years uh, under the parallel pathway after you registered and after your part one, after completing your housemanship. Secure permanent job in uh, MOH, yes. It, uh, once you, you, you have a better chance of uh, securing permanent job, in MOH, specialist training and uh, to multiple larger scope. This is uh, you must understand the medicine is a is is an entrance. You know, being a physician, you can be a large. You can be cardiologist, you can be neurologist, gastroenterologist, nephro respiratory and endocrine dermatologist, ID physician, and uh, acute med uh, internal medicine physician. All that. So it's a very large scope. Is there? how to prepare for the MRCP part one island. So you need to log in to web RCPI, Royal College of Physician Island under the exams and MRCP medicine and the dates will come for the examination and all these, when the exam, when to pay, what is the closing dates and etc. For the part one objective, best of, best of five, 100 questions and three hours of paper. It's an online, that's the best part of it now, uh, about two, one, one year plus, me, me and others in the Royal College of uh, Physicians. We, we uh, luckily, before the pandemic, we made it, the uh, Royal College of Ireland has made it online. Then you can do from home, uh, as a, all your working place office, and uh, as online under virtual monitoring. So you no need to go travel to the center, MU or other centers, unlike the other MRCP papers. So it is, you can see as an online. So it is done three to four times a year. I mean, the next exam is January. I believe if you are not prepared, I mean, uh, you need a proper time and it's closing on the December to, to uh, closing on 2021. And the next following is the May 22 and August 22. So the training webs are on examination. It's the more towards uh, RCP island paper. As we gone through the candidates, we find out that uh, most of them satisfied on examination. Uh, I mean, uh, the website for paper. Of course, you can do a past test uh, web, I mean, website and of course, you can buy some books from Kamal Books or uh, Best of Five and Practice. But uh, we have, uh, we are closely uh, with the candidates and the RCP are working with the candidates and we have a 200 over question, uh, maybe more than 300 now. 
for you to be discussed under the Royal College of Physicians Question Bank. And uh, it's only available for the RCPI part one candidates once you registered for exam, so that you have a better uh, guide, uh, what sort of questions, how is in the principally it will appear uh, in our examination. And for the exam info, uh, you can log on to www.rcpi and uh, IE, and that's a college, uh, our Royal College of Ireland uh, building in Ireland, Dublin. Okay, future of RCPI parallel pathway and MOHR. This is very important. We are well structured recently with the cooperation of MOH, MMA, AIMS, and uh, Student Association of MMA and Info and Training. Training opportunities for MRCPI clinicals reinforced by Dr. Paras, myself, and few others in the faculty. And uh, we have placed RCPI qualified trainers in regional hospital, if you say from North Kanga to Johor. So we have people to follow you up for your clinical training. Most of the hospital got RCPI uh, specialists uh, who can guide you. You are not left alone and we are well connected uh, to guide you once you pass your part two uh, uh, theory. Then you can contact us, one of us, then we will help you out how to go on some of the questions like long cases and et cetera. We have RCPI faculty in Malaysia. So, and Sabah and Sarawak also I have placed uh, in Sa Sabah, I got people there who can uh, train you. Once you go on a parallel path, you're transferred there. At Sabah also I got uh, uh, Nadarajan and Sarawak, I got Pravin. All these are well-connected uh, uh, faculty who will train you for the clinical exams. Then uh, you can take a help advice through WhatsApp group under this number. FB and Webmina, we are closely monitored under the group called RCPI Group 1. The future is uh, RCPI is recognized internationally. You can work uh, in overseas also once you get the, uh, qualified. And uh, we have a formation of the, as I told you, we have a formation of RCPI Fellowship in Malaysia formation of MMA parallel pathway postgraduate subcommittee under the RCPI and we have network of collaboration and training so that you're not left alone once you take an island paper in Malaysia. So clinical training and short attachment, short attachment and long cases, I think uh, I'm doing in my hospital, those who if you are clinical in the Northern area or central area, and Tanga Hospital and um, Hospital uh, uh, anyway in Malaysia. So you can ask for short attachment in my hospital to just to train the long cases of uh, uh, in the clinical examination. So uh, the MRCP UK and Ireland differ slightly on the long cases. We have two long cases, which is directly observed that need uh, some training. Other than that, the short cases are almost, we follow the paces. And um, under the College of Physician, Academic Medicine and Ames University campus, we are going to conduct uh, also a workshop for the skills of the long cases and talking station plus uh, other skills uh, in February 2022. So we are a sort of uh, follow, follow every RCPI uh, part one, part two candidate in your career pathway at MOH. So MRCP part one, as I told you, three to four times in a year, best of five. And the next exam is 27 of January, closing on the 16th December, 2021. And the followed by 5th May 2022 and closing on 23rd of March 22. So uh, 
25th of August also there's an exam closing on 14th of July. So what um, I need to express here is that the exams is not, uh, you know, you, you can sit, uh, you need at least four to six months to train on the uh, questions. So what I understand from my uh, experience with the most of the candidates of uh, uh, I, I learned, if you sit a day, uh, roughly about one and a half hours to two hours, then you need only about three to four months to prepare for part one exam. But however, if you don't have time and you're on HO period, you can sit a, an, an hour, you need about four to five months to prepare for exam. So if you have decided now, probably I will suggest you to take the May exam so that you have uh, plenty of time to practice the website, uh, also the other books to prepare for the exam of Royal College of Ireland. So the webs and question banks, you can find at www.onexamination.com. Then you can buy and you can share with your friend as a group study. Then you can carry on doing the on examination uh, questions. The pastor is another, uh, is another website it will be helpful for you. There are others called MRCP Pass.com and also Pass Medicine.com. The first two are most important. On examination is number one for the Irish paper. Past test also can be included in that. Uh, I believe that if you do one website or share uh, two websites, more than enough for you. So advantage of, let's talk about advantage of ILA. It is online under the metro, virtual monitoring. You no need to travel during your housemanship, no need to worry about getting uh, leave to do exam, all that. You can uh, it can be done from home, working place, and you choose where you choose. Because under the virtual monitoring, it's an online exam, part one and part two, MRCPI. So no need traveling during pandemic or MCO. Three hours paper compared to six hour paper of UK paper, part one. It's only three hours compared to UK, six hours. You need to sit for two papers for UK. And uh, training support for RCPI question bank. Uh, uh, training support for the RCPI question bank. Okay, we have RCP, we have question bank and RCPI question bank. Once you register as candidates, that question bank can give you a good idea how to do part one, what type of a question, what style it will be asked to you, what number of uh, basic sciences, what is the percentage of a clinical seals, clinical question will be in part one. Okay, that will give you a principle, uh, principle how to go on and tackle the question, uh, what qu question, what type of questions in uh, clinical scenarios will appear in part one, and also basic sciences concern. So future training support for part three clinical, of course, this is called 2A or part three, we call it MRCP part two clinical. Uh, most hospital in Malaysia, we are doing for RCPI faculty, we are closely uh, connected and uh, mostly we do for the long cases so that the candidates the RCPI are well taken and they are well versed of these long cases. So you can start as soon as possible. You should start possible your career pathway. Like it or not, you need to be compete in real world. So you need to compete. You want to be specialist uh, faster. You need to enter the parallel pathway and uh, you need to finish uh, part one, part two and clinical so that you'll be gazetted faster and you carry on your future as a sub -sexuality. All right, uh, thank you. And uh, any question you can uh, follow in my, uh, of course, my email. And we have a, a nationwide WhatsApp RCP group one under me. So you can ask how to apply, what to do, uh, so on through uh, this number. So, and uh, thanks uh, for giving me uh, all the opportunity. And thank you.
Thank you very much, Dr. Tarmalingam. I hope you all enjoy the amazing presentation. Now, Dr. Tarmalingam will answer some questions that were sent during the presentation. The first question is from Mohamed Jasman. What is the advantage maintaining the yearly RCPI membership fee? Okay, so RCPI membership fee is, uh, I, uh, first of all, I need to know uh, only when you become a specialist and you are RCPI, you receive the RCPI, then you can uh, be a collegiate member and you can, uh, some of the training will be given online for the specialist training. And plus, if you need to maintain it to get your fellowship and go on your career pathway. So that, that's for the already specialists. So uh, those who want to go as a professor, they want to get a fellowship, they're going to be an examiner in uh, membership, uh, so on. And, uh, and they want to be a trainer for the exams, they need a fellowship in the RCPI. Okay, uh, the next question. Does it necessary for a doctor who holds MRCPI to recommend or endorse a candidate for RCPI clinical exam? Or any, any specialist under KKM service are entitled to do so? Good morning, to all. Let me check the question closely. Yeah, it, it is uh, at open section, open tab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going through it. Ask, uh, so would ask trainers in parallel pathway, is it the same MRCP and island? Yeah, it is the same. Uh, both are considered same. It's uh, two exam by the two royal colleges. And MRCP have own trainers and especially. No, you see, the what I, I'm thinking about the clinical, the short cases are same. So when we do a mock exam also, the, we follow the paces uh, scenario, all that. And um, only the difference is that two long cases were directly observed in uh, MRCPI. It takes about 25 minutes in each cases. And uh, we follow the scheme of uh, 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 RCPI, but overall, all the skills are covered like paces. And um, each uh, center uh, station will be one examiner, but we cross calibrate and there will be a chief examiner moving on from one center to another center, station to station. All right. Next. Morning, Dr. I kindly ask necessary for Dr. Hull recommend endorse a candidate. Hull, I must be to recommend endorse a candidate as the clinical exam, final exam. No, no, um, as uh, for the clinical exam, when you're in a government hospital, everything, your consultant can sign for you. And um, uh, basically, you need some clinical practice. That's why we endorse you as a clinical consultant need to sign. But nowadays, uh, I need to, uh, for the island, you need to be, have some clinical practice in one of the hospital to finish off your clinical training. So somebody has to sign for you. And if you are not MOH and you're in the university also, you can ask your university consultant or professor to sign for you. The other question, uh, I have one question. If I must be island recognized by Singapore as well. Well, as I need to find out this, but it goes, I think, uh, UK and uh, uh, Irish. I'm not sure we, we need to find out whether you can work in Singapore or not. But uh, uh, I will find out and let you know. Because what I know, it is uh, recognized internationally. Uh, regarding Singapore, what is the criteria? I need to find out from you. Good point. Can, can all parts of MRC be done in Malaysia? Yes, definitely. The part one is online, part two is online. Part three clinical, of course, we try to conduct twice a year. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it is, in fact, because of the COVID is interrupted now, and I've planned, me and Paras, uh, that was three Paras, Lucy, planned 
the next examination clinical uh, in uh, February uh, 2022 in Malaysia and, uh, and uh, late February. But if you go through the uh, website, the website is not yet uh, updated so that if you see the under the Malaysia, uh, it will be November 2022. No, it's going to be in February. So it's not updated yet. And shortly after our meeting, it will update it now. Uh, next week or next, uh, and near week. Morning, doctor. Can I add the next question? Ask MRCP Island, is it no resistance in tertiary or district hospital, which is same? Which is, can I ask MRCP Island, is it no resistance in tertiary or district hospital? which is the same as MRCP. Okay. I can't understand this question. So it is same, uh, wherever you train, there's a two, one is Island paper and UK paper. Well, uh, it is in Malaysia is definitely both are same, both are recognized and both in a parallel pathway. And um, uh, we are more of uh, our candidates are, uh, are less than the compared to UK papers, and we are closely monitored. And uh, let's say a sitting for the exams of clinical is uh, for the UK paper 180, our candidates will be about 40 to 50 and uh, very easy to get a place uh, uh, to get to the uh, clinical part. Good morning, Prof. I'm not yet Prof. Anyway, may I know, is it possible to take MRCP Island six months after MBBS final exam. Yes, you can take your part one. Once you graduated and your paper, mm -hmm. uh, confirmation to say you already passed six months after graduating. Uh, MRCP Island after MBBS final exam. Yes, once you have six months after the graduation, so you can take up your paper. What is a disadvantage MRCP? Basically, there's no much of disadvantage. We, uh, we, I mean, MRCP in Malaysia, uh, I think from 1998, we are conducting the clinical exam and uh, possible that it came late, a bit later than UK. So the number of uh, candidates are uh, less, but uh, we are closely uh, doing the same like RCPI. And our exam also monitor the joint uh, committee of the island and UK. So we are following also the PACE standards. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think that's about it, Dr. Tarma. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Tarma Lingam, for answering those questions and, of course, for the great presentation. It is a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you. Next, welcome. Next, please join me in welcoming Professor Edmund Ong. Professor Edmund is the honorary professor and consultant physician from our own Newcastle University Medicine Malaysia. Professor Edmund will deliver the top tips for passing the MRCP PACES. Over to you, Prof. Thank you very much, Shira. And I would thank uh, the university and uh, all the organizers for this invitation. I'm really delighted to come and um, talk to you guys. Okay, we reference the top tips for passing MRCP paces. Now I've got an apology to start off with because some of the things that I'm gonna be talking about has already been touched on by my previous speakers and we have discussed this. It's no, uh, um, and it's been done it on purpose as well in that context that because I noticed that only, only about half of you were actually able to log on during the first half of our webinar. No problem. I know that quite a number of you have been on the call that has not only been able to log on okay, during the second half of our webinar. So you may have missed some of the presentation that has been highlighted earlier on. And in particular, like to really welcome some of our foreign visitors, our international visitors, uh, because I can notice that there are some that has come and log on from uh, Mima and Singapore. So do welcome. So this is truly an international event, not just focusing on the Malaysia, because as you can see, PACES is an international exam. 
okay, in the context that prior to the pandemic, we can see the number of centers throughout the world that PACES is being conducted, part one, part two, and the clinical PACES as well. So what have we gathered, okay, in the context of that it's such an international exam, what are the key bits that we can actually recommend to candidates who are from abroad? And indeed, I'm actually speaking from an international PACES examiner, a UK PACES examiner, because there are, prior to the pandemic, a number of candidates that pay all the way from these respective countries and fly all the way to UK to sit the PACES exam. And we have noticed and collected data in this respect to see what are the key differences? Okay, are there any things that we can do to be constructive to feedback to these individuals? So these are what is actually highlighted, okay? UK graduates, there's a great majority of the single skill failures do not score adequate marks in skill B, identifying physical science. And the non-UK graduates, as highlighted, most unsuccessful candidates fail to score adequate marks in skills B, C, which is communication, and or with E, which is clinical judgment. Malaysia and Singaporean candidates are actually a little bit better, okay, in the context, but generally speaking, non-UK graduates, the key area that they don't tend to do so well is in skills B, C, and or, or E. So do you know what passes paces? This has been highlighted before. You don't fail each station, okay, as Dr. Luchman have just highlighted to you, you must pass each skill. This has been highlighted before, okay, you must also pass every single skill, okay, in the context, because if you just obtain 150 marks and not achieve the minimum 130 marks, you do not pass the exam. And this has been highlighted and I'm not going to dwell on it too much. Yes, there are cultural and societal differences in the way that you deal with patient. And remember, this is a UK-based exam. I have been fortunate to have actually in a position to have worked and train doctors who are sitting for the PACES exam in Asia, particularly in Myanmar, in other parts, okay? And what we have actually been concentrating on is to make sure that they are actually appreciating those cultural and linguistic influences, particularly on their clinical communication skills. There's good evidence, very good evidence of this on one of the many studies that cultural factors that makes cases a little bit more difficult for doctors who are practicing in other parts of the world, okay, particularly not in the UK. So there are, I'm not going to dwell too much of it, the four cultural dimension, the power distance, okay, in the context of unequal distribution of power in the society and the degree in which less powerful members accept this, exhibiting large degree of hierarchy order in which everybody has a place and which needs no further justification. In UK, all junior doctors are regarded as a members of the team. There is not much of a hierarchy, okay, aspects of it. There is not such a thing as a good like consultants, okay, in the context, okay, you, you address each other by the first name, we talk to each other, we go out to have, you know, a makan, we go out to have a drink in that context. And there is the uncertainty avoidance as well, okay, in the context of attempting to cope with anxiety by minimizing uncertainty, okay, and there's individualism versus collectivism, okay, in the context that, you know, people in society are integrated into groups, okay, a culture is deemed individualistic, okay, if the members of the group are supposed to care for themselves and the immediate family only, so yes, this is actually a major challenge in that context and masculinity versus femininity, okay? And yes, I think uh, previous uh, speakers have highlighted this in this context. So I think you need to bear this in mind, okay? You have seen various versions of the PACES carousel, okay? And just to remind those of you who log on late, okay? In the context that there are essentially five stations with eight encounters, right? 
and that uh, this is actually a, a, a color distribution of this uh, carousel, which I think you have to bear in mind. And, and you may, okay, the senior medical students, and particularly from our university, would recognize this, hey, this is very much like our Mosler exam structure. And indeed, our Mosler senior year examination template is based on the PACES carousel, well-validated uh, validation tool for assessing clinical skills, communication, and professionalism. So I'm not going to go too much on this, okay, in the context that this has been highlighted, the seven clinical skills, different numbers, combination of skills, and different encounters, the three-point marking scale, zero, one, and two, and there is no overhaul judgment mark that is required. We don't have a, what we call a global assessment. And yep, okay, this has been highlighted previously. I'm not going to dwell too much on it, okay, because the mark is based on each of these individual seven skills. And I just would like to just repeat, okay, physical examination, identifying physical signs, clinical communication, differential diagnosis, clinical judgment, managing patients' concern, and maintaining patient well-being. So these are the uh, uh, skills assessed in the, in the respective station, which has been highlighted previously. And these are the marks, okay, that are being assessed on those core clinical skills, okay, which I'm not going to dwell too much. Okay, Dr. Chiu has actually uh, highlighted this to you, okay. The physical examination skill is based on your clinical examination technique, not the ability to detect physical signs. So it's quite important, okay, if you appear hesitant or in the local uh, language term appear kalang kabut, okay, you are not going to score well, okay, in this context, okay, because the fluency of your technique is key in this part of the assessment. And yes, physical signs, identifying them correctly and don't make up any physical signs if they are not present. Clinical communication, clinical history relevant to the patient's complaint in the systemic, thorough, fluent, and professional manner. And this is actually repeated in station five. That's why station five has got so many marks attributed to it because it tests all the seven skills and you are able to explain relevant clinical information in an accurate, clear, structured, comprehensive, fluent, and professional manner. Skill C is uh, tested at station two, four, and five. And as highlighted during the pre-cycle calibration, okay, we, the scenario is rehearsed with the surrogate or the patient to ensure consistency of responses. And yes, indeed, okay, we have got professional role players, okay, people who are trained, okay, particularly here at our university, we've got a bank, okay, of surrogates that undergoes regular training. It's not just someone that is picked up from the street that can speak English, that comes and become a role player in that context. And this is the same in the majority of all the examination centers in United Kingdom. And obviously one is ensuring the surrogate and patient can answer any questions that the candidate is likely to ask. The differential diagnosis, yes. I think, okay, it has been highlighted uh, in the context that if you are able to give the top unifying diagnosis, do mention it in your discussion first, and then subsequently with the other sensible differential diagnosis that you may want to elaborate on, okay? So clinical judgment, you must be able to provide and show the skill that you are able to negotiate a sensible and appropriate management plan for that particular patient, relative or a clinical situation. And obviously selecting appropriate investigation or treatment for a patient that the candidate, okay, that you have personally assessed. Clinical knowledge, including knowledge of law and ethics, it's relevant to such a clinical case for the judgment, for the clinical judgment skill to be judged. So skill E, you can see understanding of physical sign, investigation, management, solve a clinical problem, right? In the context, 
So skill F, managing patient's concern, you seek, detect, and acknowledge, and address either the patient's or the relative concern, and you listen to your patient or relative, confirm their understanding of the matter under discussion, and you demonstrate empathy, which has been highlighted by the, our first speaker, okay? So patient and surrogate will be asking you at least one question, okay, in that context. And manage, managing welfare, I don't need to emphasize this, okay, in the context, because we have got guidance about roughness, okay, in the context, either in the uh, aspects of being physical or verbal, okay, in the context that I think, as, as rightly pointed out, okay, you uh, uh, will not be performing well at all. And in the United Kingdom, if you score a G, it's essentially what we call a yellow card, which means that this candidate warrants a counselling uh, uh, post-examination. So, very important, okay, in the context that, so those of you who have just logged on, okay, during the second half of the uh, webinar, examiners calibrating in all the cases at each station. We spent a phenomenal time, okay, agreeing on the physical signs and the key bits of that particular station. And it has to be in concordance, right? Specific areas that the candidate needs to cover in order to achieve the two marks. Criteria are based, okay, on the guidance provided, okay, and therefore, we has been emphasized with the parallel uh, training scheme, where you're talking about the four year training scheme. It's actually, we are assessing how competent that trainee is to enter into higher specialist training, which in the United Kingdom is an ST3. We previously has got what we call a core medical training program, which has now been replaced with an IMT training program, integrated medical training, which only follows after the initial two years of foundation program. So if you think about it, you will be in the best position to actually give yourself the best chance of being able to tackle this exam in an optimal manner, four years, round about the four years post-graduation. Okay, you're talking about two years foundation program, one year ST1, which is your co-medical program previously, ST2, okay, which is, means that you are actually in your fourth year of your medical training postgraduate program, and you are now going to be entering into ST3, okay? We had, had obviously an issue in the United Kingdom during the pandemic, because previously to enter into ST3, an MRCP is a requirement, okay? But as you may realize that uh, there is no such thing as contra uh, contract doctors in the United Kingdom, okay? We are, they are all on a job application competitive scheme, okay? You apply for your training post. Therefore, if you are good, you get your training post, okay? If not, then you have to think about something else. No, we don't have unemployment in doctors in the United Kingdom. We are still rather short of doctors, okay, in that context. So I'm more than happy to answer a bit more, okay, in that context, but just to make sure that you realize when your best chance where you're gonna sit for your passes clinical exam. And I like the term that Dr. Lushman uh, used in terms of uh, you know, going down on a roller coaster. If you feel that you have done badly at one station, it is important that you try and remember that this will not affect your marks at the next station and that you can still pass the exam. The five minutes interval between one station and another is actually quite important if you have that experience because you can use that interval to concentrate on the next station and not to reflect on what went before. I know it's difficult, but I think it's a skill that you need to also acquire. And this can be particularly difficult at station one and three where you have got no scenario to read to where you have to okay, sit there and remain quietly. Examiners realize that you may be anxious and this may affect your performance. The more you practice, the easier you'll find it that you keep your anxiety under control. Okay, you must demonstrate good technique when you examine the major clinical system for your skill A, okay? 
in a thorough and methodical manner. And station one and three, you have to complete that examination in no more than six minutes. In station five, you must be able to perform a focus examination of the areas relevant to the scenario you have read. So read your scenario properly and the history you have obtained from the patient in front of you. You should start, okay, considering starting the examination at the same time that you obtain the history. So it's very much like a scenario that you will be in a acute medical assessment unit, okay? So this is trying to actually replicate the, the real life scenario if you are working in an acute medical center assessment unit for station five. Reason that you may have not passed skill A, you have not examined in a systemic way, you're using incorrect techniques. You're missing out significant parts of the examination. Your examination was hesitant and lacking confidence uh, because the examiner thinks, hey, this candidate has not done this uh, every day, day every, in and out. Okay, you must give the impression that you do this examination in every daily practice and work that you encounter. And you are examining in a professional way or Worse, you examine the patient through their crawl. So what can you do? You want to examine as many patients as possible, which I keep telling also my medical students, okay, there's no replacement for clinical contact. Medicine is a contact sport, okay? You see your patient, including those without clinical abnormalities. This is no replacement. Have your examination technique for the very system observed by your clinical supervisor, okay, which um, uh, Paras have actually very elegantly de demonstrated to you who, you know, if you're in a training scheme, you will have a supervisor, okay, or by more other senior colleagues who can give you critical constructive feedback. Use a timer when you practice to make sure that you know how long you have to perform each aspect of the examination. Skill B. Identifying signs, you must be able to identify the key signs that are present. You must not report clinical signs that are not present, which is equally just as important because it creates bad impression. You need, not, you need to be able to present the signs in a logical, clear manner to the examiners during discussion. And the ability to identify physical signs is one of the most important skills of a physician even in the era of relatively easy access to investigation, okay? So you don't have, you know, uh, the way that you're, oh, what, other, what, other, what investigation has been done and so forth. No, you examine your patient first and you direct and focus your ranking of your investigation depending on what the history and the science that you elicit. Confidence in this skill comes with practice. Reasons that you may have not passed skill B, not identifying the signs that were agreed to be present by the examiners during calibration. And during the calibration, there may be at least seven or eight clinical signs that are there. The two examiners may decide that, yep, it may not be fair to actually ask the candidate to elicit all those seven to eight signs to get the two marks, they may say that they must get the minimum of five of the physical signs to get a two, okay, in the context. If they, they may also decide that if there are a number of physical signs that is crucial to that station, and if you don't elicit it, it may actually give you a one, okay? So finding physical signs that are not present as well uh, 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 is, is one of the many reasons that you may have not passed skill B. Examine as many patients in a systemic way, including those with abnormal clinical signs so that you are comfortable and reporting when physical signs are not present. Discuss with your clinical supervisor, ask your clinical colleagues again to actually observe you, examine consenting patients with clinical signs and all the relevant system. And you may want to ask colleagues from a range of specialties to observe you, examine consenting patients and discuss both your examination technique and findings with them. So those are the tips for you to help you to improve. Clinical communication, right. I examine in a variety of ways, depending on the station. Being able to communicate clearly is essential to get an accurate history 
so that the underlying medical and personal and social issue can be addressed. This is key to patient safety, right? In that context. So verbal skills, questioning style, chunking and checking, summarizing, use of silence, eyes, ideas, concern, and expectation. Facilitatory expression, right? This is going to be challenging, which I'll talk to a little bit uh, uh, just now. Sign posting. The nonverbal skills of the sitting arrangement, the eye contact with your patient, the facilitatory gesture, the posture. The facilitatory gesture is challenging in this day and age of the COVID-19 pandemic because everyone will be wearing a mask and everyone will be wearing a face shield. So you need to be able to actually listen and speak clearly through those barriers and exploring the patient's perspective, okay, in the context that what does the patient think the problem is? What does the patient fear the problem is? Any other concern? Expectation, what is the patient expecting? Treatment outcomes and explanation, okay? What has the impact of the illness been? Work? Hobbies, leisure activities, mobility, activities of daily living is crucial. Ask the patient what matters to you, not what's the matter, okay? Very different direction of question. So establishing eyes, okay? So assess the patient's understanding. When you felt unwell, what were your thoughts about your illness? What did you think? What were or are your main concerns? I'm interested in your thoughts about what may be helpful before I make any suggestion. This is an extremely important opening manner to actually establish patients' expectation and their understanding. So setting the uh, uh, scene. Make sure you introduce yourself. Check the patient's name, age, occupation. Are you working at the moment? I understand you have come today to receive some results. I understand you have come today to discuss some concerns. Discovered what has happened since last seen. Summarize where things have got to date. Calibrate what the patient is thinking and feeling. You need to get that assessment, okay? In the context and negotiate the agenda. The patient may not agree with your plan of action. If it's so, you need to negotiate, okay, in that context. So allow the patient to complete the opening sentence, open-ended questions, avoid medical jargon. Not every patient understands what multiple sclerosis is. Not every patient would understand what motor neuron disease is, okay, in the context. You must be able to, um, to explain it in a non-medical jargon language. Leading question. So be sensitive to the patient. Read the non-verbal signs, right? This is challenging because the patient will have a mask on and a face shield. You may or not be aware that there has been a pilot that has been happening in United Kingdom for station two and four since the pandemic of using telemedicine for station two and four. In the context that the role player or the surrogate is in another room with a camera and you are in another room and looking into a television screen along with your examiners, and that's where you conduct your station, okay, in the context, because the nonverbal skills as signals of the facial expression of the patient actually is uh, 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 crucial in some aspects. So some centers, if they're in the United Kingdom, it is not happening outside the United Kingdom. If you happen, some of you who are flying all the way to do your exam in the UK, the centers will alert you, okay, if this is actually one of the methodology that they're assessing station two and four, okay? Face body languages, silences, tears, as well as 
the what is said, right? Acknowledge the emotion. I, yes, I can see you're anxious about that. Okay, don't leave it hanging in the air. I am sorry to hear, okay, uh, what has happened, okay, in the context, empathy, okay, it's important, therefore, displaying your sensitivity to the patient uh, emotion. Check understanding. What do you know about your condition? What have you been told so far? How does the news leave you feeling? I'm sorry that was difficult to you because that is the seeking the emotional impact and acknowledge emotional content, okay? Response to the patient's feelings and predicament that with acceptance, empathy and concern, check understanding. Would you like to run through what you're going to tell your wife, okay? Or do you like to run through what you're going to tell your daughter, okay, in the context? Warning shorts, breaking bad news. I'm afraid it looks more serious than we hope. I'm afraid it looks more serious than we anticipated. Basic information, simply, honestly, using appropriate language, chunk and check, allow the patient to ask questions. So offer specific help by breaking down overwhelming feelings into manageable concerns, prioritizing and distinguishing between the fixable from the unfixable. You cannot promise things that you cannot fix. Okay, summarize consultation, identify a plan for what is to happen next, offer ongoing support, early follow-up appointment, offer to speak to spouse or partner, support systems, okay, they are available, offer written information and thank and thank a patient for coming. Do not assume anything, particularly in respect of alcohol and smoking. Train and learn about quantifying alcohol in units per week, smoking and pack years, and beware of the ex-smoker and the ex-drinker. So the difficult areas are obviously rare condition, breaking bad news, end of life decision, sensitive subject, in particularly in relation to sex, complaints, medical errors, okay? Skill in aspects of Handling difficult communication comes with practice and practice, a skill that can be developed through practice. Station two, four, and five, you must be able in station two, systemic and thorough history, identifying concerns and agreeing a management plan in no more than 40 minutes. In station four, you must be able to explain relevant clinical information in an accurate, clear, structured manner need a structured interview, yet remain flexible enough to respond to questions and concern. You may be a patient or a surrogate. You should then spend the full five minutes reading the scenario to ensure that you are clear about the task you have been asked to perform. You've got that five minutes of reading. In station five, you're required to take a focus history based on the scenario you've been given. I emphasize a focus history. Reason that you may have not passed skill C is not explaining the relevant clinical information in an accurate and clear fashion, missing out important information, inaccurate or unclear information, or information that includes too much specialist language that the patient did not understand or was deemed to be unprofessional. So reflect on the comments on so when you are doing practice, mark sheets and discuss it with your education supervisor or a senior colleague. Practice information gathering, information giving as much as possible, asking patients for the feedback, okay, as well as being observed by senior colleagues. If English is not your first language, practice speaking English as often as possible, including the use of medical terms that you should try and convey in an easy and understanding terms in order to avoid confusing specialized language, okay? There are plenty of samples, okay, at the MRCP UK website. These are very similar to those that you are going to encounter in the examination and an excellent source of practice material. And obviously asking one of your senior colleagues to watch you taking a history of communicating with a patient or a surrogate are tips that will help you to improve. Differential diagnosis is a linked skill, 
means that if you fail to identify a physical science, which is skill B, you are all going to be marked down on your differential diagnosis. You must include the correct diagnosis and indicate an appropriate differential diagnosis for the patient in front of you. You should mention the most likely diagnosis first, which has been emphasized by the previous speakers. A good differential diagnosis for the wrong signs will not be regarded as unsatisfactory. Why you fail skill D is giving a poor differential diagnosis, failing to consider the right diagnosis, and giving a textbook list rather than a list of likely diagnoses that are relevant for the patient that you have just seen. Practice discussing the differential diagnosis for all the patients that you see and ask for feedback from your colleagues. Now discuss it with your clinical or educational supervisor or a senior colleague, okay, and practice case-based discussion of patients. Arrange to be observed, okay, while you examine patients and formulating differential diagnosis. Skill E is, again, clinical judgment is a linked skill. If you fail to identify the physical signs, and particularly if you fail to consider the di correct diagnosis, which is skill D, you will be marked down on clinical judgment. You must be able to suggest appropriate investigation and discuss a sensible management plan for the patient you have just seen. Good management of the wrong condition will not be regarded as satisfactory. Why you will not pass skillly is not being familiar with the correct management plan, suggesting an appropriate investigation or management for the patient and failing to identify the correct signs or reaching the correct diagnosis which you have then suggested an incorrect management plan. Reflect on any feedback, okay, that you may have, okay, that you are doing your practice with your senior colleagues. You want to examine as broad as possible a range of medical patients and follow this by discussion, differential diagnosis, appropriate investigation and management. And if you feel that the exam, okay, expose some knowledge gaps, yes, you need to build up on your knowledge gaps. Skill F, the ability to identify main concern is important to ensure a satisfactory consultation. So all the scenario for station two, four, and five has specific question for the patient and surrogate to ask of the candidate. You must demonstrate that you have asked the patient or surrogate if they have any questions and answer them accurately and sympathetically you should ensure that the patient have understood your explanation and discussion. Not exploring the patient's concern in enough detail or addressing the concern in a satisfactory manner, not listening to the patient or relative, not talking over the patient and relative, not checking the patient relative understood what you have discussed, you're appearing unconcerned and failing to build a rapport with the patient, and you're running out of time to ask the patient relative if they have no, any questions to answer them are key reasons why you may have not passed skill F. Review any again, okay, on your practice one, okay, what your identified areas of weakness, reflect on where things have gone wrong during each scenario and discuss it with your supervisor or senior, senior colleague. When you're interacting with patients, focus on identifying the concern, ask for feedback on your performance, and if English is not your first language, use every opportunity to practice potential scenario and use a timer during practice to ensure you have sufficient time to specifically ask the patient relative if they have any questions or concern. Skill G, I'm not going to actually uh, dwell too much of it, okay? Um, in the context that this is obviously essential for safe clinical practice, Doctor-patient relationship, if you fail skill G, okay, you have caused patient emotional and uh, physical discomfort, okay, and that you have jeopardized the patient's safety. And in the United Kingdom, that warrants counseling for what we call a yellow card, okay? You have remands, tips of how you would like to relatives, okay? It's quite important. Perhaps you think, what would be, I like my relatives to be examined and cared for, okay, in the context that the patient is like a relative to you. So lots of advice and resources that has been highlighted on the website. And there are videos on YouTube on sample station two, four, and five. 
what you can expect on the day, how to uh, advise how to prepare and preparation courses. So thank you very much. Okay, I um, uh, uh, would be more than happy if you uh, the questions that they have been posed following my presentation. Thank you. Right, okay, I think. Ah, ah, right. Okay. Uh, Q and A. Ah, the answer is: Can a candidate, candidate request a feedback from the college with regards to his or her performance in the exam? Yes. There are uh, what we call an appeal mechanism, okay, in the context that if you fail the exam, okay, and if you want to actually uh, ask for feedback, particularly in the context that you, if you think you are given a very detailed breakdown of your performance in, 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 in paces, you say, why did I fail station one, okay, in the context, okay, and therefore, uh, uh, there would actually be uh, an ability for people to actually have that feedback. Yeah, okay. Um, I've, in my last slide, okay, I've given you quite a lot of resources. There, for, for preparing for PACES, can I just want to mention this again? There is no substitute in actually clinical exposure, okay? Practicing it, okay, seeing real patients, communicating with them, okay, in the context of actually the, doing the physical examination. What you actually, if you think about it, that's what you have been uh, educated to do as an undergraduate, okay, we've gone through this, okay, in the context, and therefore, if you look upon, okay, these aspects of the postgraduate training as an extension of the undergraduate training, deep down, okay, particularly in key areas of internal medicine, okay? Clinical, you know, the, the, the seven skills that we talk about, okay? That's why uh, uh, if you actually continue to do that, then you should actually uh, be in the position to fall in, okay? By the time that you are in your fourth year, fourth year of post-graduation. So if you think about it, let me just emphasize again, two years foundation program, in United Kingdom, it's three years in the ST1, ST2, ST3, which is very similar to your four-year training program that Paras was highlighting to you about, okay, in, the, in that context. So towards the tail end of the foundation year, which is F2, individuals, okay, trainees are expected to have passed the part one MLCP because that gives them an edge, okay, to actually apply to an IMT program. It's all open competition, okay? The more, okay, uh, the, well, the, the qualification that you have, okay, plus you know, your, your, your report, okay, in, in, in the context of what we call your ARCP, okay, everyone undergoes through an ARCP, very similar to the four-year training program that Paras have actually highlighted to you of those key aspects, okay? And then um, if you score your enough marks, okay, then you actually will enter into that training program. No, okay, it's, uh, um, we, right, no, for all the paces, station two and four will be all English speaking patients. Okay, English speaking patient and will be station five. Okay, there are, okay, there are drawbacks in translator because you heard the term, you probably have heard the term loss in translation. Okay, in that context. Prophet? Yeah. I think it looks like we have covered all of uh, the questions or yeah, I like think I think I've actually answered most of the questions. Yep. Yeah. Okay. 
All right. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Ed, uh, for joining us today. Okay. Dear ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the virtual masterclass internal medicine as a specialty, the fast track way. On behalf of Newcastle University Medicine Malaysia and our guest speakers, thank you for joining us today. We hope you have learned and enjoyed today's session. Take care and stay safe wherever you are. <laughs>